Okay, our next speaker is uh, Aracio Aguirre Villegas. He was from the University of Wisconsin Madison. Uh, he's an assistant scientist. He's from Bolivia, but uh, came and we worked together. And he is the source of all modeling information um, and pr has some great information to share with us uh, about a recent uh, modeling effort he put together using some. Uh, I think this is the survey data. Yeah. Okay, survey data, and then transforming that through some modeling things done in Wisconsin. So here is a slide advancer. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Thanks uh, for being here for presentation. So I'm gonna keep talking about Monier. And when we started uh, this project, uh, one of the key components was the initial management practices that we were going to consider throughout uh, the life cycle of dairy production. And we wanted to see what uh, these management practices were in Wisconsin. So today I'm going to present some of the results uh, of a study that we conducted to first uh, get information on the most common management practices in Wisconsin, and then to relate these practices to greenhouse gas emissions. So that's some introduction. Probably we already we already know by right now that uh, manure is a very important component of the dairy farm because it has some valuable nutrients, but also at the same time it is a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. Right? Manure is responsible for around seven percent of the methane and agricultural methane and nitrous emissions, and uh, is also the second source of greenhouse gas emissions at the dairy farm level after dairy methane. Uh, also, uh, we saw that up to 70% of the nitrogen excreted can be emitted as ammonia, depending on the management practices during storage and land application. Uh, and then this has further implications because it has water quality issues, or this ammonia can eventually be transformed into a further contributing to climate change. Uh, so it is, and this, all these emissions are very uh, susceptible uh, to the management practices that are adopted uh, in farms. So it's very important to identify which practices are being currently adopted. So the objectives of, of this study were to first identify these management practices, uh, then to develop inventory data on them, uh, compare practices uh, of based on farm size, different farm size groups, and finally relate both greenhouse gas emissions and ammonia emissions. Today I'm just going to talk about greenhouse gases, but the data is there for ammonia as well. Okay, so for this, uh, we did two things. First, we collect, collected the data for a survey that we sent online to more than 2,000 farms in Wisconsin. Uh, uh, we got a pretty good response rate for permitted facilities, like more than 20%, uh, but uh, like 5% for the rest of the farms, so less than 1,000 animal units. And we first think that uh, one of the reasons for this lower response for smaller farms was that the survey was online, uh, so that could have been a problem. And also that we sent uh, postcards to go into the survey only one time. We had several comments that, that we have to follow up with like third or four times uh, in order to get our, our response. Anyway, uh, the survey um, had two main areas, general farm operations uh, and manure handling, which that's the main focus of this talk. Um, we divided the farms into four groups according to size. One to 99 animal units, we classified that as small farm. The medium farms with 100 to 199 animal units, large farms from 2 to 999, and then permitted facilities that have more than 1,000 animal units. Uh, we had oops, we have 143 responding responses, uh, and how these translate to the farm population of each group? Well, pretty good for permitted facilities. 21 percent of the permitted facility population. That's the response that we got. 5% for large, for large farms, 2% for medium farms, only 0.2% 0, 0, 0 uh, for small farms. Um, so the results for this <coughs> farm size group have to be interpreted with caution due to this small sum size. Uh, this graph just shows all the, the different steps that we uh, consider, consider in our survey and also in our modeling exercise. 
throughout the manure handling uh, part. I'm going to focus on, on the blue components here today, uh, starting with manure excretion, but characteristics of manure, the different um, types and, and amounts, uh, how manure is collected, it's in steer, it's paper, if it's transported to, to storage, how it's transported, if there's some kind of processing in the farm, uh, then um, how it's land applied. And besides like asking the different um, these management practices, we included specific questions related to energy consumption. And if the farmers didn't know that, then time of operation and the power size of the machinery used in order to calculate energy consumption. Um, so the second part, after getting all these management practices, we use modeling tools to quantify greenhouse gas emissions. First, we use life cycle assessment techniques uh, to get a full picture of what's happening uh, in all these steps. Uh, also, we use equations for, uh, from the ISN model um, for methane and nitrous oxide. And then we use the survey data for energy consumption and fossil uh, fuel emissions that are related to this. Finally, we model nine scenarios. Uh, we pick three representative farms, a small farm handling solid manure a large farm handling liquid manure and a permanent facility handling liquid manure with processing. Uh, and the reference the scenario for each of these was basically representing the most common uh, management practices reported in the survey. But also we model a low greenhouse gas emitting and a high greenhouse gas emitting scenario based on the management practices for each farm in order to compare results. So some results for the survey uh, for management practices. This graph shows uh, the type of manure being handled uh, by small, medium, large permit facilities. As we can see here, the majority of small farms, the 16 uh, respondent farms handle solid manure. And as farm size increases, then the total solids decrease the manure. So 45. Uh, Permanent facilities responding to the survey, 80 percent handle liquid manure. Um, so this graph shows uh, into the left here. We can see how manure is collected, or, or what technologies are used. Uh, in small farms, uh, gather cleaners and, and barn cleaners are mostly used. But as farm size increases, then we can see that skid steers and LED scrapers are, are used as well. And as farm size increases, there's a wider variety, variety of collection methods. Uh, we, in terms of transport after manure collection, uh, in small farms mostly transported to land, so it's directly land applied. Uh, Long-term storage is starting to be more um, common for larger farms. Um, and also permitted facilities transport manure to processing. Uh, this indicates uh, that you know larger farms are more able to invest in large storage structures and smaller farms. Okay, for storage, uh, we collected some information on the type of storages that are uh, mostly used. Um, we can see that as with the collection methods, there's a wider variety of storage systems being adopted by larger farms. Uh, um, below ground concrete and clay lime earthen basins are the most common ones. Um, with land application here, we can see that the small farms uh, usually use surface application. But as farm size increases, then we have injection coming into play. And the permanent facilities have uh, actually all types of land application, surface and injection. Okay, also related to land application, I include this graph here because I think it's pretty interesting. Uh, it shows the hauling distance uh, from the farm to the field uh, versus the number of animal units. And you can see that there's an increase in hauling distance as farm size increases until a point in the permanent facility group where it starts to increase. So this suggests that probably the smaller farms have more land for animal unit than permanent facilities, which has, of course, implications for manure application. Um, 
in terms of processing, um, only permitted facilities recorded some kind of processing <coughs> of the sand separation of those farms that use sand is getting solid liquid separation and anaerobic digestion. Uh, for solid liquid separation, mostly screw presses were used. There are a couple of farms that reported centrifuge. Uh, for anaerobic digestion, mostly modified plug flows in Wisconsin, um, plug flows as well. Uh, some, some farms use uh, complete needs digesters. Um, we can see that the anaerobic digestion is always coupled with second or third technology. It makes sense to farther uh, separate, uh, to digest the solid and liquid streams when you have anaerobic digestion in these farms. Uh, for these farms, uh, an average of 1.5 cubic meters of biogas per animal unit was calculated mostly for electricity production that is connected to the grid at 25% capacity factor. Okay, so now for the second part, uh, we have these management practices that have, we have been having identified with the survey. So we put together these nine scenarios. Uh, this table shows the different management practices that we considered in each of them being the reference ones here uh, in the middle, um, the most common ones. And then we have these low and high greenhouse gas emitting scenarios that we also model software collection, for example, skid steer, which is diesel uh, fuel, it uses diesel fuel, versus uh, park cleaner and oil scraper that use electricity. So we want to see how that affects greenhouse gas emissions transport. Uh, pumps mostly used in larger farms, uh, no transport, or a tanker in smaller farms. Processing only uh, reported by permanent facilities, most commonly. Uh, the farms respond to this survey with all three sand separation, anaerobic digestion, and solid liquid separation because they use sand as day. Um, but also, we wanted to see how solid, li solid liquid separation without anaerobic digestion um, perform in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Storage, uh, usually mostly done by large, larger farms. Uh, basically, we change the retention time, usually. Nursery storage for six months, so on the life of here in spring and fall in Wisconsin. But we want to see what happens if we consider shorter periods. Uh, and also, we evaluated uh, storage with a natural grass formation on top, uh, with and without. Uh, this is important because it has implications in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. This natural grass, uh, organic grass, creates aerobic conditions on top of the storage which could reduce methane emissions, but at the same time could increase N2 emissions. So we want to see that. And for lab applications, surface application and injection mostly done for OK, so this graph summarizes the results for all these nine scenarios. Small farms here, these first three, large farms, uh, second three, and permanent facility result in this last uh, group of three parts. You can see that in small farms, greenhouse gas emissions are dominated mostly uh, by N2 emissions that happen in, in application, land application. Uh, but then as farm size increases, we saw that manure type transitions to a more liquid form. So there's a need to start thinking about storage systems. And this is where uh, methane uh, happens. Uh, and the storage of liquid manure creates you know, the perfect conditions for methane to occur. So, Large farms, mostly methane emissions from storage. Uh, but then as economies of scale justify, then there's bigger farms and permanent facilities that can afford some kind of processing uh, where greenhouse gas emissions can be significantly reduced. These first two are uh, the scenarios with anaerobic digestion. And we can see that reduction in blue here, not only from the methane from the storage, but also uh, included uh, <coughs> avoided emissions from the fossil grid electricity that's now uh, being replaced by biogas electricity. Also, solid liquid separation reduced uh, with com compared to, to, to large farms, uh, methane emissions from storage, which I mean, solid liquid, liquid separation is uh, probably much cheaper than anaerobic digestion, so it's really a good uh, processing strategy for farms to consider. Uh, in terms of collection, uh, here in, in, in orange, 
Uh, we saw that uh, electricity-based systems, so alley scrapers and barn cleaners are a little bit more efficient than skid steers, so lower uh, greenhouse gas emissions here. As we included uh, storage in this high scenario, of course, there's methane emissions in storage, but as we reduce the retention time uh, from six months to three months, we can see a, a reduction in methane emissions during storage, but I mean, uh, storage is a main driver here of, of methane emissions, but at the same time, it has some other benefits for water quality uh, objectives that, that we need to consider. So it's probably not feasible to just get rid of, especially in Wisconsin, at this scale, large farms that handle liquid manure to get rid of the storage system. Um, in terms of surface application, uh, sorry, land application, um, I didn't include uh, ammonia emissions here, but of course, uh, injection reduced ammonia significantly. Um, at the same time, reducing indirect uh, related potential nitrous oxide emissions that could happen from this ammonia. But also, we saw that there was a, a slight increase in direct NCO emissions from injection instead of surface application. And the overall effect of these two was neutral here, so we saw no change. Uh, in terms of NO2 emissions here. Okay, so for the conclusions, we saw that small farms, mostly um, uh, emissions in small farms are mostly driven by application in the form of nitrous oxide. But then as farm size increases, then storage plays a huge role in, methane, in the form of methane emissions. Uh, but then as, as, as economies of scale justify that there's some kind of processing that can be done in order to mitigate these emissions and the anaerobic digestion is probably pretty expensive for some farms, but there are some other strategies that we need to start considering, like just covers, you know, to reduce methane and, and also uh, ammonia emissions. So there are these different strategies here that we need to consider uh, in order to reduce our emissions in farms. So with that, I think I'm going to finish. Thanks to USDA for funding the project. Uh, if you want to see more information on this study, ammonia emissions, or the other management practices and different uh, you know, energy consumption rates, etc., that's all uh, included in the paper that's published in the journal in the production. Or you can write me an email or we can talk. I'm going to be here until Friday. Uh, so thanks so much. Now, open to questions. Two questions. The first one was diet assumed to be the same across all the facilities. Uh, no, good question. No, uh, we had information on the diet, so the diet, diet was differentiated based on small the responses of the farms. So small farms, medium farms, so all had different diets. Yes, and, and different milk productions uh, and different manure excretion rates. Yes. Right. So that would kind of matter there. And then for the follow-up, since you found that the storage was the greatest um, area, and you mentioned two things like covers, aerobic storage, decreasing um, solid content in there can all affect that. Do you guys have plans to look, take your model, look at that piece so specifically? specifically? Yeah, that's that's a good question. I think that's something that we can start exploring. And that's, that's like the big uh, player here. Uh, Yes, yes. Uh, we were thinking about modeling different strategies, just focusing on storage. That would be great information. Okay. Like, uh, Perfect. <laughs> Good to know. We're going to think about that then. Include that in our model. Sure. Uh, I know nothing about your dairy industry there, but how, what would, I assume the larger dairies would have more capability to make change. Is that right? Mm -hmm. and yes, in terms of like economics. What percentage of the cows? Large areas. Large areas. I think we're question. creeping up to 50% of the, or maybe 40% of the animals are in large. Oh, good. You're other data guy. There you go. <laughs> so still not, not a huge percentage of the cows are on large facilities, permanent facilities. So I, what did you say, 20%? 20 to 25%. Yeah. On, on so still a lot on smaller facilities. Yeah, animal units are above, so permanent. Yeah, but as you pointed out, the majority of the outcomes from those farms, the larger farms, 
Sure, they, they definitely usually have higher milk production per animal. Um, yep. Any other I mean, questions? You know what, that's a good question, and we didn't get any composting in our survey. Oh, so no farms reporting you. composting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we do see it. We certainly see it. But we didn't um, have any responses, so we didn't include that part. All right. Okay, thanks very much.